Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you here today. Uh, as you may have noticed, we have someone special on the platform today, and that is none other than Reverend Rick Hyde of Arkadelphia. And he and Stephen, as you probably read, have been fast friends for a long time. Stephen's not a stranger to us. He's been here before to preach for us, and we're so glad to have you back. We look forward to the message you're going to bring today. Once again, I get to say those magic words. Would you please take the purple pew pad? <laughs> Would you like to say that with me? Purple pew pad. Isn't that fun? It just rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? Take that, please, and fill that out and pass it to the other end of the uh, pew, as we would like to have a record of your attendance, members and guests alike. Uh, don't forget tonight. Tonight is the watermelon feast after worship. So don't miss that. It's going to really be good. This year, I'm sorry to say, because of COVID, the seed spitting contest has been canceled. <laughs> but we will have plenty of watermelon for you. All right, let's continue our worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Deuteronomy 6 5. Thank you. 
Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Father, thank you for the beautiful morning that you've given to us. Thank you for the folks who are here and the spirit in which we worship. Help us once again to get a better understanding of who you are and the kind of people that you want us to be. For it's in our Savior and Lord's name that we ask this. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
prayer. Oh, blessed Lord God, you are our blessed assurance, and thank you for all your mercies and blessings that you give to us. As we gather here today in your house, be with us, fill us with your spirit, let us take it with us as we leave. Dear old Heavenly Father, as we collect this offering, let this offering go for that purpose that we might touch everyone in this world that would have a chance to come to know you. Dear old Heavenly Father, all those that might need your healing or comforting care, we put in your care, you know the needs of all. And I always part with this, Lord, fill us with your spirit that as we leave this place that someone might see your light in us and through that come to know you. And we ask all this, Jesus' blessed holy name. Amen.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, creatures here below. Oh, praise Him, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus, whose power of bliss. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. As I come into your presence, Pass the gates of praise into your sanctuary. We are standing face to face. I look upon your countenance. I see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say, You are awesome in this place. Mighty God, you are awesome in this place of a Father. You are worthy of all praise. Your life, our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When the Spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes. Lord, yes, I will serve Thee because I love Thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before You found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives for why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I long for. You have given life to me. Amen. Where are you now when darkness seems to win? Where are you now when the world is crumbling? Oh, I, I, I hear you say, I hear you say, look up, child. Hey, look up, child. Hey, where are you now when all I feel is doubt? Where are you now? When I can't figure it out Oh, why? I, I hear you say I hear you say Look up, child Hey, look 
up, child. Hey, look up, child. Hey, look up, Yona. You're not threatened by the war, you're not shaken by the storm, I know you're in control. Even in our suffering, even when it can't be seen, I know you're in control. Oh, I, I, I hear you say, I hear you say, Look up, child. Hey, 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 look up. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. I thought the stand was for me. <laughs> Not, this time. Not this time. Open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, the second chapter, the 18th verse, page two of your pew Bible. Can't get any simpler than that, can we? All right. Genesis chapter two and verse 18. It's good to be with you this morning. I always look forward to coming to Levy, Levy, Levy. Levy. I'd have to learn. Levy, all right. Leviites. Okay, I like it. Uh, I think I've met most of you. I've been here several times now. Not now, my name is Rick Hyde. I'm a retired Baptist pastor, but still preaching every Sunday. Uh, slowed down a little bit during the COVID time, but I've been all over the state of Arkansas. My last, uh, as a full time pastor, my shelf life turned out to be 10 years. Uh, I was 10 years pastor at the First Baptist Church in Murfreesboro, Arkansas, where the diamond mine is. Ten years, pastor of not first, not second, not third street, not third avenue, but third Baptist church in Malvern, Arkansas, where Acme Brick is. And then after that, ten years at First Baptist Church of England, uh, not the one across the ocean, just across the Arkansas River. And then about ten years ago, retired to Arkadelphia. And when I retired from England, uh, I just said, Lord, if you'll let me preach, as much as I can, I'll go anywhere. Doesn't matter how far, how near, how big, how small. And a few months ago, a lady called me and I said, hello. And she said, do you mean what you said on that Facebook page? And I said, ma'am. <laughs> I said, what did I say? And she said, you'll go anywhere to preach, any place. Doesn't matter how big or small. I said, I, yes, ma'am. And so I went up into northwest Arkansas to a place I never heard of called Han, about three hours from my front door and had the best time. And I've been back there several times. So. I love to preach, almost as I like to eat watermelon. <laughs> now, last time I was here, I said I was coming back on Sunday night to hear Stephen preach, and that didn't work out, but now I'm going to try tonight. But don't tell him, all right? I've never heard Stephen preach. You know, and especially you're going to throw in watermelon. You know, I can't miss that. Stephen and I met several years ago. I'm old enough to be Stephen's dad, I'm sure. I'll be 70 in January, 
And we met one Christmas Eve at a Lord's Supper service in Little Rock and uh, became fast friends because our hearts beat the same when it comes to worship and doing things like that. And I really like Stephen. And he trusts me to come and fill the pulpit. So it's good to be here. Thank you. Cheyenne, you still in here? Oh, she went with the children. Beautiful young lady. All right. You tell her I said thank you. All right. Choir. Oh, you don't know how much I like to. I never get to preach in front of a choir or behind a choir or beside choir anymore. Choirs are rare these days, and I really appreciate your faithfulness, much less your talent. And the pianist and the organist. And you bought a new organ? Is that right? Sort of organ, different organ, but you got confidence in the organ. All right. Amen. I tell you, I miss organs. I miss, I miss choirs. I miss hearing worship music that has a melody in it. So I don't have to just know, you know, chords. So, but now I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be picky. I like, I like contemporary music. You know, it's some of my favorite stuff, you know, and, uh, uh but I want some hymns too. I love the hymns. All right, well, enough of that. Let's read the text. The book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 18. We find these words. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Listen to those words once again. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. I appreciate the good folks here, uh, the welcome that they've extended, and we look forward to what you're going to say to us this morning. You've already spoken through music, through prayers, and now through your word. Help us once again to just try the best we can to understand who you are and the kind of people that you want us to be. If there's someone here that needs to make a personal or a public commitment in their relationship with you, I pray that this will be the day that they do it. Be with Pastor Stephen and his wife as they're away. Keep them safe. Give them a safe journey back here tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Helpers. We all need them. All right? Helpers. I like the story of the little boy who was acting up in church and his daddy finally got enough of it and picked him up and was carrying him out the door. And the little boy was old enough to talk because as they left, he said as loud as he could, Y'all help me. Pray for me because I'm in trouble. <laughs> We all need helpers, don't we? If I were to title this message, and I did, it's called Faithful Families. Faithful Families. You know, there are many kinds of families, especially in our culture. There's the traditional family. That's mom and dad and used to be seven or eight kids, all right? And now I think it's 1.5 kids. I want to meet that 0.5 kids someday, all right? Traditional family, mom and a dad and at least one kid, a couple of kids, all right? Then there, there's not only the traditional family, there's the blended family, sort of like the Brady Bunch. Anybody old enough here remember the Brady Bunch? Uh, Brady had three boys and Miss Brady had three girls and they somehow, somehow they got together and they made the Brady Bunch. All right, A lot of families are like that. Traditional blended families. There are single families. You know, there's just mom or dad, never been the other partner there. We see more and more of that. There are traditional blended, there are widowed families. Maybe a husband or a wife has died. I think if you're a guy, you're a widower. If you're a lady, you're a widow. We see many families like that. We see some broken families. Families that are bad need of being fixed. Broken in many ways. God calls us to help them. There are non-traditional families, and we're not going to go too far down that road, all right? But I like what the Bible says about the ideals. You know, we're called to love all people. Even the sinners. You know, Jesus spent more time with sinners than saints. He did. We must love the sinner, but never tolerate the sin. Now, that's not easy to do. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is some families that you, some of you may not be aware of, at least one of them. And that is three families that God wants you to have. Three. Now, somebody out there is saying, good Lord, I do good enough to take care of one. All right. But there are three families that God has for all of them. One's very obvious. But there are two others that so many people miss out on. First one is this, the obvious one, earthly family. It comes in all sizes and all kinds. I'm the last of seven children. Mom and daddy grew up in northeast Arkansas on the cotton fields. Mama on the Alexander Plantation about six miles from the Missouri state line of the boot heel of Missouri. Say it right now, not Missouri, it's Missouri, all right? I tell people I'm a Missourian by birth. That's, it's Missourian, isn't it? I'm a Missourian by birth, but I'm an Arkansasian by the grace of God. I'm not even Arkansan. I'm an Arkansasian. But they grew up on the cotton fields there. 
And when daddy proposed to mom in 1929, he said, Ruby, I promise you there's a better way of making a living than cotton. And so they went to St. Louis. They went to the big city. Daddy got a job with Yellow Transit Freight, driving a forklift, became president of the union there and had a good life in St. Louis. And I'm the last of seven. My brothers and sisters, two brothers and four sisters, are born three years apart in the summertime. And I came along seven years later in the winter. Figure that one out, okay? I was raised an only child. If my oldest sister were still living, since I'll be 70 in January, she would be 93. I have one brother left alive, and he's 20 years older than me, and so he'll be 90 soon. You probably have a traditional family. Maybe there's two, three, four, maybe no kids at all, all right? But there's the traditional family, sort of the American pie, apple pie, Norman Rockwell painting, Courier and Ives kind of family. Genesis 1.26 says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, I'm not going to be funny there, try to be cute, but male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God's plan is for families. God wants us to have families. Now, you may have the best family in the world. You may not have a very good family life or may not have had one in the past. A lot of folks have trouble relating to God as father because too many people had jerks for daddies when they were young. I hate to use that word. But the most abominable thing to me is to see a man mistreat a woman or a child. Jesus said it would be better for you if they tiled a millstone around your neck, threw you in the deepest ocean, than you offend or hurt a little one. So take that for what it's worth. I hope that you had a happy childhood. I had a great childhood. But there was one thing lacking in my childhood that should have been there, and that was there was no spiritual aspect to our home. Now, my mom and daddy were good people, good moral people. They gave me more than I deserved. My brothers and sisters to this day, well, there's only one left, but they just love to gig me every now and then about, you got everything and we got nothing. Because I came along when daddy was making good money. Had a great home life. You know, got to pick out my own Christmas presents like an only child. Got to get it, whatever. My daddy only denied me one thing in the eighth grade, and I wanted it so bad, and that was one of those little Honda motor scooters. Boy, I wanted one of those so bad. Had a good home life, but I did not have a church life. Oh, listen. I am so glad that God led me to the second kind of family. And that's a church family. A church family. The Bible says very clearly in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day, that's the return of Jesus approaching. Oh, I had a good earthly family, still have a great, great, have a great earthly family. God gave me Kay. We met at Washita Baptist University. I was just transferred in and she was from the area, a little town called Sparkman, and they didn't have a pastor at their little country church. And Uncle Gramble said to her, Kay, you're over there at that school with all those preacher boys. Get us one for Sunday. She asked a friend of mine. He was busy. He gave her my phone number. She called up the dorm I was in, and she said, are you available Sunday? And I said, in more ways than one. <laughs> and less than a year later, after I met her, I married her. I did. The church called me as their pastor while I was in college there. I remember that deacon's meeting that night. It's a good time to ask the question because he was the only one there, Uncle Granville. Her daddy was a deacon, but he was working in a factory in Fordyce that Sunday night, and another guy was gone. And I said, Mr. Granville, do you think anybody would mind if I dated Kay Holman? Uh, Uncle Granville said, you don't think we caught you out here just to preach to us, do you? And then he looked at me as serious as he could, and he was serious. He said, by all means, do so. But if you break your heart, if you break her heart, you'll have me to answer to. So like eight months later, I married her, all right? We fell in love immediately. Oh, God has blessed us tremendously. Son and a daughter. I have three songs, words I want you to hear this morning. This one goes with the earthly family. It was made popular by a husband and wife by the name of Steve and Annie Chapman. People talk of miracles, blinded eyes that were opened, how the lame could walk again, prophecies that were spoken. But I can tell of a miracle God did just for me. He made me one with my wife together 
He makes us a family. Well, I may never see the Lord turn water into wine, and I may never live to see a supernatural sign, but by giving me a family, He's given me the best, and I know that it's a miracle and nothing less. In the Word, you can find them there. The works that Jesus did, <clears throat> how He fed 5,000 with a handful of fish and bread. But I can tell of a miracle greater than walking on the water. He's added to our family now. He's blessed us with a son and a daughter and a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law and four grandchildren, all right? Well, I may never see the Lord turn water into wine. and I may never live to see a supernatural sign, but by giving me a family, He's given me the best. And I know that it's a miracle and nothing less. If you don't have a happy home life, an earthly family, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you even if I don't know you or your name. And if you were ever to share with me something, it would be confidential unless it was something against the law, which I would have to report then because we're bound. We're mandated reporters. I hope you have a happy earthly life, earthly family. But if you don't, I'm going to tell you the church family can help you. Now I know the headlines have been filled with all the reports of the abuse that have gone on in churches. And we Southern Baptists tend to lead in everything, even in abuse reports, all right? Like I said a while ago, the best thing you can do to someone who's abused a child, put a millstone around the neck and cast them in the ocean. What do you mean by that, preacher? At least send them to jail, all right? For Ten years I lived at the first bat in English, Arkansas, just down the road, was Tucker Max. And for a year I was assistant to the chaplain. And then the money ran out. And I went for a while on my own. And when I first went out there, I said, the last thing you need is a bunch of preachers out here preaching. What do you need? He said, I need some help. He said, when I take a holiday, I need someone here who can deliver notices of illness or death to the inmates. I said, okay. So I went through the training, and as I became familiar with Tucker Max, do you know who they house at Tucker Max? It is filled with men who have been convicted of molesting children. And you know why? Because if you put those men in a regular penitentiary, the inmates will kill them. Even they can't tolerate that terrible sin. So I led a couple of them to the Lord, baptized a few of them, delivered some death messages. And the chaplain there said, none of these men should ever be let out. Never. He said, but we're the only ones that stand between them and eternity. Listen, church people are human people. We fail. We stumble at times. We Baptists are also famous for fighting and fussing, aren't we? You know, there have been more Baptist churches split because someone didn't like the color of carpet or the kind of music sung or the type of pastor that was leading there. Oh, listen, let's try to be famous for the most important thing to be the church. And I read it to you from Hebrews chapter 10. What? That's to consider one another, the Bible says. Consider one another. Don't forsake assembling. Come together. Exhort. Encourage one another. We need to do that. Now, I want to be known as many things in life. You know, I want to, but the main thing I want to be known when it comes to preaching is I want to be known as a good news preacher. Gospel literally means good news. Now, as Vance Havner said, to really appreciate the good news, you got to know what the bad news is. He said every sermon should have three points. First, the good news. Paul always said, grace and peace be unto you. But then the bad news, but there's a problem. He said to the Thessalonians, he said to the Colossians, there's a problem. But then he told them how to solve the problem and he would end with, I'm praying for you. Grace to you. Oh, I want to be a good news preacher. Someday I'm going to be buried. You know, I, a few years ago when Kay and I got married, well, it would be 47 years tomorrow, all right? And she went to Chattanooga today. But we have a happy marriage, okay? She's with the grandkids this week. 40, I guess, shortly after we married, I said to her daddy, I said, Paul, we've decided we're going to be buried here, here in your family cemetery, the Holman Cemetery. And I, so he said, okay, well, we need to move my markers down to the fence. I said, okay, what's a marker? Now, I'm a city boy, born and raised in inner city St. Louis, six blocks from the old, old Sportsman's Park. Daddy brought me to Arkansas when I was in the eighth grade. When he retired, age 13, I came kicking and screaming. But it's a good thing he brought me here because this is where we found church. But I was, I said, okay, what do I do? He said, well, you need to, what's a marker? Well, it's a granite marble thing about like this and about that. You gotta go, go, go dig a hole, you know, and move it down there. Go over there and get your shovel and the post hole diggers. And I said, okay, what are post hole diggers? <laughs> so I'm down there digging, got these post hole diggers working, and the UPS truck stops. And he's looking for an address to deliver a package. And he says, 
what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready for my grave. He said, if you're going to stare at you standing up in a hole, you've got a long way to go. You know, this past Wednesday, I officiated the funeral of my son-in-law's daddy. A little bit older than me. I think he was 74. You know what the worst thing about growing older is? It's bad enough we get the aches and the pains and all the medications we got to take, but we start going to too many funerals. Too many funerals. Oh, listen. How will you be remembered? How will your family remember you? The earthly family. Were you a good dad? Were you a good mom? Maybe you, maybe you didn't have children of your own, so to speak. I hate when they say it that way, but maybe you love children in the church. You taught them. You loved them. You helped them. How do you want to be remembered? Well, I finally decided this week, and I said to my daughter, I said, if you have to, start a GoFundMe page. You see, y'all do, anybody here do Facebook? You know what a GoFundMe page is? I want the biggest, best, biggest. Listen, I'm a big guy. Don't I deserve a big headstone? I think I do. I want the kind that's upright, which my father-in-law, if he were still alive, he'd say, you can't have that in this cemetery. But yeah, mine's going to be that way. And what I want on it is, you know, the name Hyatt on one side. And, I, you know, just you've seen them. A lot of families have them. And on the other side, I want 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, and the three points that go with it of my best sermon in granite or whatever that is, marble. All right? That's what I want. You know, I thought for a while I'm going to go Billy Graham's route. You know what Billy Graham's tombstone says? A preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think I'll put that on there somewhere too. The church family is so important. It helped us so much. Me, unchurched child, never been in church. Not in my life had I been in church. I gave you my testimony the first time that I came here several years ago. But daddy retired and moved us across the street from a Baptist preacher. Actually, Caddy Corner, if any of you know what that means. Caddy Corner. Every Saturday, Brother Vester, a World War II veteran, a, a dairy farmer who had to quit because he was so badly wounded at the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, God called him to preach. He helped my daddy in the garden. He'd help him fix the house. They became fast friends about the same age. And every Saturday... Just before Porter Wagner came on the television. Y'all remember Porter Wagner? Or maybe it was the Wilburn Brothers first. Or maybe the Road Show. But there were like three country shows there. Just about 15 minutes before airtime, Brother Vester would walk across the caddy corner. My daddy would be sitting on the front porch. Oh, he loved to do that. And he'd say, Mr. Hyde. And he'd say, Brother Vester, call me Hoss. No, Mr. Hyde. They call my daddy Hoss, not because he was a big man, but not like Cartwright on Bonanza. When he was a little boy, his mama never cut his hair until he went to school. He only went to two grades. And when the first day when he went to school, he carried his little stick hoss, stick horse. And they all made fun of him and called him Hoss. So, Mr. Hyde, is tomorrow the morning you're going to come hear me preach? No, preacher, we've talked about this. It's not for me. You're a good man, a good neighbor, but not. Well, Tell you what, just come one time. Just come one time. And if you don't like it, tell me so, and that's okay. You know, I can, I can take it. He said, but now the more important question, is today the day you're going to ask Jesus to be your Savior and promise to let him be your Lord? No, preacher, that's not for me. As my daddy would later tell it, he decided to go one Sunday morning so he could tell the preacher, been there, done that. And at age 55, Youngest man to ever retire from his union in St. Louis at the time. He had the years in. At age 55, he decided to go one Sunday morning. And it was the same Sunday morning that I decided to go. I went on Sunday nights because I got free pizza and free watermelon in the youth group, all right? But I decided to go that Sunday morning too. We did not know each other was in the building. Small country church, but it was packed. It was the closing service of a two-week revival. They used to have revival meetings two weeks long. And the preacher preached, no air conditioning. This was August of 1968. I was 15 years old. Daddy was 55. Invitation was given. I walked down. The light bulb finally went on in my head what I needed to know, what I needed to do. I'm so glad I didn't have to take a doctrine test to get saved. I didn't know what those words meant. I didn't even know what... I didn't know. But I went down. Brother Vester led me through the sinner's prayer. I asked Jesus to be my Savior, promised to be my Lord. My daddy was on that side. He did the same thing. And I looked up, and he's walking towards me, and I was scared to death. I thought I had done something wrong. 
I heard these words from my daddy only twice in my life, and that was the first day when he hugged me. He had never done that before. My daddy was a good man, but he was not an emotional man. He hugged me, and he told me he loved me. The only other time I heard that was on his deathbed. He was dying. We all knew it. And he said to me, I love you. But even more than that, 37 years ago, I heard these words, the only time I've heard them in my life. I'm proud of you. Church family brought about that change in my daddy. He got a good dose. He became the custodian, the van driver, drove the van to pick up the widow ladies on Sunday morning, went with the kids to camp to serve as a chaperone, paid for me to go to a Baptist college. He thought at first that that was a foolish idea. All this, that, and the other. My church family. Oh, I hope you have a good one. And if it's this one, I know it's a good one. You're doing it great. If I lived in North Little Rock, I'd come join Levy Baptist Church. Did I say it right that time? I'd come join. I would. If gas wasn't five dollars like four dollars a gallon, I might drive up, just come. All right. This is the kind of worship that I like. But now, if you don't, if you want more contemporary worship, there are churches like that, you know. Rick Warren said it well when he said, when it comes to worship music, what's important is not the sound, not the music part, but the words and the spirit of the person singing it. Okay? We need to remember that. I told you the churches I've served down through the years. Most recently, I was interim pastor at a little country church outside Arkadelphia, First Baptist Church of Curtis, Arkansas, halfway between Arkadelphia and Gurdon. I was supposed to stay for one year, and five years later, I said, folks, okay, this is it. <laughs> In fact, when I went with them, we had a covenant together. And I said, now you need to understand, I'm going to be gone a lot because when I get invitations to preach and I want to go, I'm going to go. And I'll have you a preacher here. Boy, they helped us out so much. You know what they did the best thing for us? And I've been in Arkadelphia 10 years and was their pastor about five. They helped us pay off our house. I had retired. And their generosity, they paid me much more than I was worth. Church families are great. I hope you got a good one. You need one. And uh, there's a song about the church family that I like. Boy, you made my day. We did a little gather a while ago. <laughs> Gathers, they wrote this song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags into riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. So I'm glad, so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. The Gathers were our praise and worship music back in the 70s, all right? A lot of folks didn't like it. We don't like that newfangled music. What tickles me is that you go somewhere and they're doing Southern gospel. Back in the 30s, that was that newfangled music that a lot of folks didn't like, all right? And I'm sure back in the 1600s that somebody wrote a hymn. John, they said, John, John Wesley, we don't like that newfangled stuff. Oh, listen, you need a church family. Oh, I loved mine dearly. Calvary Baptist Church in Perigold, Arkansas. Oh, the churches I've been part of down through here. i got some good friends here. The Brazils are here. Brad and Cynthia and their son who's in college up at the university. Ethan. I hope I got that right. Yeah, Ethan. <laughs> I'm in the Brazil part. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They knew I was preaching here this morning. We're going to do lunch together after a while. Good friends down through the years. I was privileged to be their pastor once upon a time. Well, the last family now. It's 11.08. I'm going to assume since Facebook said you close at 11.15, I better get through. <laughs> at first I thought with this platform was out there, I thought that's the proverbial trap door that's going to open at 11.15. <laughs> the last family, the third family, the heavenly family. All right. Now, the earthly families come in all sizes and all kinds, and church families come in all sizes and all kinds. All right. Big churches, little churches. Contemporary churches, classical churches. But the church family is a little bit different than the first two. When I get to heaven, a lot of reasons I want to go to heaven, but one of the big reasons I want to go to heaven, all right, 
Now this, we're talking about the end time. Jesus has come. The redeemed are with Him right now. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There is a great cloud of witnesses right now. That's the redeemed of the ages, Old Testament, New Testament, our age in the church calendar. Did you know that the people of heaven are witnessing what we're doing right now? Someone's, oh no, preacher. No, no, that's not going to happen because there's no tears in heaven. That promise is not till the end of the book. That promise is not until after the judgment seat of Christ in which our works are examined, those of us who are believers. Listen, if God can be grieved by the wrong choices we make, and He is, I assure you the redeemed of the ages are up there. At times they're grieved when we make the wrong choice. Now, you can argue about that if you want to, but I got Scripture there for me, Hebrews 12, 1. Now listen, the departed, the loved ones of the ages. Oh, I look forward. Now, I don't want to go to heaven today. I want to hang around for a while, all right? But God has answered my prayer. I have prayed all my life, let me live long enough so my grandchildren will remember me. My dad and Kay's dad died two days apart. Our daughter was seven, our son was four. They really have no memories of Papa and Grandpa. Now, our children, your grand, most people my age have grandchildren getting married. Our, my oldest grandchild is eight years old. We all got started late. I had eight, four, two, and newborn. Little Lucy has had two heart surgeries and will have two more. You pray for little Lucy. She's doing good. She's six months old, only been home one month of those six months, going back to have some heart. But she's do, the, the outlook is good. They're fixing it, all right? Everybody loves Lucy. I love Lucy. You pray for Lucy. But when it comes to, you know, I'm in the modern age, and my two-year-old granddaughter, now, of course, the newborn doesn't know me yet, I guess, but my two-year-old granddaughter could pick up Daddy's phone, punch the button called FaceTime, and say, Hi, Pappy. <laughs> that amazes me. We spend a lot of time on the road and in the air. Oldest grandson, 900 miles north in Minnesota. Been there all his life. The other grandchildren, 600 miles east in Chattanooga. Boy, but listen, if I were to die tonight, die tonight, I would die a very, very happy man. God's given me everything I've ever asked for. Well, there's one thing I'd like to do. I'd like to go to the Holy Land. Hadn't done that yet. If I live long enough and my knees get to working better, maybe. And I'd kind of like to go to New York City this fall and see Hugh Jackman in The Music Man on Broadway. <laughs> at our wedding the big love ballad from that play was sung till there was you yeah, we got engaged that week 47 years ago but the heavenly family all right oh you got to be part of it how do you become part of the heavenly family you got to get born again you were born one time into an earthly family you were born into a church family when you joined it you got and you were born into the heavenly family when you got saved a long time ago all right you ready to go? No, I don't want to go today. I'd like to live a little bit longer, I guess. But it comforts me to know that the departed loved ones who are believers are in heaven right now and are encouraging me even as I speak. I think it pleases them when we do good things. I really, there are a lot of books that are, are not worth the paper they're printed on. Be careful when you read books about heaven and people who died and came back. I only trust one of those guys. That's because I met him, I know him, and I've visited with him many times, and I've had him preach for me several times, and that's Don Piper. He wanted his book to be entitled 90 Minutes at the Gates of Heaven, but his editor just insisted 90 Minutes in Heaven. Don Piper got to the gates. If you haven't read his story, read it. See the movie they made of it. The guy that, not the voice of Darth Vader, but the guy who played him in the, in the first three movies, Hayden Christensen, plays Don Piper in the movie. It came out a couple of years ago. Don Piper got to the gates, and I'm not going to tell you his story, but except for this part. I agree with him. When each of us go to heaven, you will be greeted at the gates by believers. The first ones you will see will be your loved ones, your friends, and those who led you to Jesus Christ. And then after you get, you got to have all eternity. And then you'll get to go visit with Lottie Moon and Billy Graham and the rest of those guys, okay? I'm looking forward to that day. There's a hymn that sings to this. 
It's the fourth verse. Oh, that with all the sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. That's the last verse of all. Hail the power of Jesus' name. Oh, I'm looking forward to the day. I am. When I get to the gate, I want to see my mom and my dad, my father-in-law, my best buddy in the world. I buried him two year, three years ago, Mike Rice. We went to college together. I want to see him. A lot of folks down through the years. The last thing I have to say to you is, I guess 11 years ago now, when we first moved to Arkadelphia, my youngest sister, older than me, called me living in Colorado and said, Ricky, little Ricky, they called me little Ricky because I was born the same week little Ricky was born on I Love Lucy. <laughs> I'm so glad they didn't put little on my birth certificate. She said, Ricky, will, little Ricky, will you come out and see me? So they say, I don't have long to live. She had cancer. I went to see her and we had a good visit. She was ready to go meet the Lord. And the next day I get back to Arkansas and her husband called me and said, Claudette fell last night. She's in the hospital. She's delirious. They say she's not going to live through the day. And I said, oh, I hate to hear that. She said, she, 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 she's so delirious. She thinks she's at the gates of heaven talking to your mama, your daddy, and your brother Gene. And I said, Dave, I don't think she's delirious. And if nothing else, I'm so glad to hear that because my brother Gene, when he was barely 13 year old, years old, was shot through the heart with a 22 and died instantly. We were an unchurched family in St. Louis. And I know God takes care of children, but you know, I always worry he's 13. And when I told that story to my sister Phyllis, she said, why well, yeah, Ricky, don't you remember the last summer that you, that just before Jean died, uh, mama let you go to a, vac a vacation Bible school. And Jean, he got saved and he wanted to get baptized and, your, and mom and daddy wouldn't let him. And so he slipped out of the house and went without them knowing it. And I said, how come I didn't know that story? I said, I'm so glad I heard that story now. The question is simply this. I always end with a question, all right? Are you in the family, all right? Are you in the family? If your earthly family needs help, let us pray for you. Let us help you. If you need professional help, we can recommend you to people that can help. Are you in the church family? If you want to be in this family, you can come this morning. We're going to sing a hymn as we close, a song as we close, and make your desire known. But then when it leads to the heavenly family, maybe you're missing someone and you just need some encouragement. You just need to come and kneel and pray. You're looking forward to that homecoming. Are you in the family? Let's stand together. Our musicians are going to come. And if there's some way that I can help you or anyone in this church, you come and make your desire known. We're going to sing only trust him. Couldn't have picked a better song to close with. Come, every soul, my sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. For Jesus shed His precious blood, Rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson blood that washes white as snow. Only trust Him, only trust Him. Only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will 
will save you now. Amen. Let's go get lunch. Yes, sir. After. After. You have to come in one of them. Six months. Yes, sir. All that is now grace and peace be unto you. Is that good enough? That's wonderful. You are deceased. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 